Aid, welcome. Thank you, Daniel. Nice to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Well, thank you for writing this very thought-provoking article that led me to get in contact with you that has uh, led us already to have uh, a bit of a chat about some of the questions I'd like to develop a little bit more fully today. Um, really framed by the question you know, <laughs> that uh, accompanies this article in the, the British Wheel of Yoga magazine, why practice yoga? And um, it's a question that sort of hangs over what a lot of people do um, without ever really being answered or perhaps even acknowledged it's often assumed as you say that you know, people practice because they like it <laughs> and uh, that's fine until it doesn't quite work and as you point out very openly and honestly in the uh, the first few paragraphs of the article um, you were confronted by injury and uh, it was that that led you to wonder had you been deluding yourself that yoga was actually something that you enjoyed a great deal when you discovered you needed a hip replacement yeah. and uh, I wonder if you could Talk us through a little bit of the background to getting to that moment and uh, yeah, how, you, how you dealt with it when it arose. Yeah, I think the, um, the hip replacement was kind of a culmination of a growing period or a period of growing questions about practice. It, um, yeah, the, the article presents it in perhaps a bit of a, a, a kind of a trigger or a dramatic way, which was to do with the mm. way it was presented rather than the way I wrote it. But the um, yeah, the, the process evolved out of a, a series of questions, really, about what's going on and where where are we headed, and that started perhaps ten years ago, perhaps fifteen years into my yoga journey, hmm. and yeah, it came out of a series of, I suppose, just e e e events that led me to say, well, what's that about? Why? yeah where's that that doesn't seem right that doesn't feel right it doesn't feel like it's got any great benefit in terms of um the wider goals that i was so immersed in at that time because i got very into um reading not just yoga philosophy but um you know, modern buddhist uh, commentaries mm -hmm. on um certainly from the american camps people like jack cornfield and what have you and um yeah, I, I guess just questions about a, a disparity between what I was seeing in not just my yoga practice, which was, you know, the classic Ashtanga form at that time, 90 minutes a day, six days a week, da -da -da -da, moon days off. Uh, and when I went to um, Maui, I was traveling every year to Maui at that time um, to work with Nancy Kilgoff. It was um, mm -hmm. it was the same pattern, but with other people. So most of the time I was practicing on my own, three or four months a year, it was with Nancy and the group of nutters that ended up on Maui in those days. It was brilliant. <laughs> Fellow Ashtanga addicts. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, you know, there was a huge amount of uh, really positive stuff came out of that period. I think for me personally, you know, some of the the most significant changes came around integrating or being with all of those different people hmm. so i think you know i like a lot of people i was in my early 30s mid 30s at that point and yeah i kind of got into a bit of a into a groove i was with my people doing my thing you know i had a family i was i was doing the thing and um i, I think what had happened is that having had a period of quite expansive uh, university years and travel years after university, I was kind of narrowing down quite nicely. Thank you very much. And what Maui did for me uh, was really blow that open. So it opened a lot of doors and a lot of interactions with people and ideas that um, I probably wouldn't have engaged with had I just encountered them outside that particular vehicle. And the same with yoga philosophy, I think, even though Yoga philosophy wasn't something that Nancy projected. Nancy's teaching was very much just about the asana, just about the process of Ishtanga forms. That's a bit unfair, but largely so. Mm -hmm. um, I got very interested very quickly in in the texts and you know the commentaries around the text and different modern interpretations of that, and you know what all this was about in terms of historical traditions and so forth so 
although it was never done from a very academic or even cohesive point of view, I, that from a personal interest point of view, it was a, definitely a big part of what I was engaging in. Um, but yeah, again, some of those ideas, I don't think I could have taken on board or would have even considered taking on board had it not been within the vehicle of something that I was you know, deeply committed to, partly because it was just a physical practice. And I was pretty much just a physical person you know it was that was kind of where I was coming from so so you were quite athletic before Ashtanga yeah I, I lifelong um history of sort of sports and activities I suppose I was a I was a swimmer as a child and um and then I became a, a triathlete and then a runner and then a climber so it was, you know there's a lot of sort of high activity stuff going on in life um and when I started uh, yoga, actually, it was it was as I was coming out of a period of pretty intense running. So I'd mm. done um, a number of years of mountain marathons and, uh, yeah, got some injuries there, which actually ties into where we're going with this, which is yeah, the, you know, the hip replacement. Because at that time, around about the time I started yoga, I had a recurrence of a knee injury that had existed from before before mm. and the beginnings or the first incidents of a of a hip injury that didn't seem particularly significant at the time but was notable stopped me running for a number of weeks mm. after a big event so that's kind of where or well, points to the roots of those injuries now scroll forward i suppose it was about four years into um, the Ashtanga practice, maybe a little less even actually. I was working with John Scott and Lucy uh, down mm. in um, Penzance when they were in Cornwall at that time. And um, I ended up having a, a meniscus tear repair in my left knee. Um, as a result, I think it's fair to say, as a result of over twisting the knee that already, it, this was the knee that had been damaged during the running years. Um, that led up to that point. I'd stopped running by then, but of course, all the um, striving for lotus type activities that were going on at that point in practice uh, led to some inappropriate twists, which probably led to the, the the deepening of the tear and finally a trim. It, you know, it got to the stage where it was getting stuck, and it, yeah, it was untenable to really just deal with it. Even though that's what I tried to do for quite a long time. We're not married. So, well, actually, it was a bit more than Grin and Barrett. Thinking back, it was practice, practice, all is coming. The practice will resolve this. We have to go through some difficulties in order to go through a realignment, uh, a recalibration of the body, which is sometimes uncomfortable. Yes. And, yeah, looking back, without... Yeah, I think I've gone past the point of blame now. But looking back, I was that was completely delusional, um, mm. in the sense that, yeah, really what I should have recognised, could have recognised, was that this was a recurrent injury and it should be dealt with because something was aggravating it. And if I had looked in that way at that point, or been pointed in that way at that point, I may have developed a pattern shift, which subsequently I have achieved mm. but long time down the line um and having had you know the the knee injury in the first place so or the knee surgery in the first place so you know just to be clear yoga didn't cause the problem but the way i practiced asana in those early days certainly aggravated the problem to the point where i had to get a surgery intervention surgical intervention to to deal with how bad it got I think that's a very interesting and you know quite poignant distinction that you make there and um, it's easy I think to almost miss the subtlety of it because it almost sounds like letting yoga off the hook whereas actually yeah. you're getting more specific about what's going on in a yoga practice and it's the way one is approaching uh, a repetitive you know kind of um, asana focused approach that will be problematic if you're going to do the same thing unskillfully again and again and again obviously that's going to 
cause strain and if there's an underlying condition it's going to get aggravated so that bit is just you know, common sense but then i do i do think there is also the other level of it of of questioning whether that approach is more likely than others to cause that sort of an outcome and uh, and whether people involved in it are open enough with themselves with each other with their students about that possibility and uh, yeah, I'm, I mean, if you talk about if you if you mean by that approach the Ashtanga form versus the Yenga form or any other, you know, I guess the Ashtanga way. falls under that category just purely by virtue of repeating the same sequence day in day out and slowly adding to it and uh, yeah, eventually upgrading as you get more proficient. Yeah, uh, possibly. Although to be honest, I could see the same issue occurring in something like the prescriptive mm. positioning of something like the Iyengar form, the it's little I know I've, of. I've, well, so, I've, I've got experience in both, and I've seen as many people with hip replacements in the Iyengar world as in the Ashtanga world, yeah. so I, th I think you're right. I think anything really that, that leads you to do something that is at the range of what's possible for you mm. in a way that is not about learning it for yourself in other words being very aware of what's happening and what the implications of that occurrence are has the potential to cause injury because you mm. you're yeah you're superimposing a uh, an idea onto the body that is not necessarily capable or ready to perform the position that you're requiring of it or um. And this is quite a, an important distinction too, or the way that you engage with that posture is something that actually you are perfectly, or your system is perfectly capable of doing, but the way that you approach or arrange yourself in the context of that shape is, isn't working. And unless you recognize that, or you know, it's brought to your attention that it's not working, yeah, and then you just keep doing it that way, then even though the alternative or a different way is perfectly feasible, you never do it. Mm. And this is something, you know, for me has become, yeah, I recognize it quite strongly in myself, but I also, I've also seen it in an awful lot of students now over the years, recognizing that people bring a series of patterns to practice, asana practice. Exactly. Mm physical and psycho-emotional, and then do the asana practice with those patterns and often just keep, you know, they just find a new way of playing out the patterns in, in a new context. Um, and I did a lot of that. You know, I did, I transferred quite a lot of the physical activity principles into practice. And some cases it worked really well. You know, I was a very strong beginning practitioner, not a very bendy beginning practitioner, but a very strong one. And that helped in some respects. Um, and it didn't help in other respects because I used that strength inappropriately in so many different ways that, you know, there are consequences long term or it just got in the way when I was doing asana. Pushing too hard. Is that a simple summary, would you say, or is it subtler than that? Uh, I think it's a little, it, I, well, I don't know whether it's subtler, but it's certainly more expansive than my initial reaction to those words are pushing too hard implies to me quite a psychological element. Mm. I'm, I'm striving too much to achieve something. Yeah. But in, in me, it was, it was that, but it was also I, I was used to being able to use my body in a particular way in order to get results. So as mm -hmm. a climber, I was used to kind of an effort-based, balance-related, but effort-based mode of movement. As a runner, there was a real sense, and as a swimmer, I suppose, there was a real sense of going into, we used to call it the blue zone in swimming. It was, you know, it's that territory where you, you're going beyond the point of ease and into a place of challenge, knowing that you can become really skillful at using that place of challenge and that's you know in competition swimming that's a really 
it's not just a useful it's an essential skill to have if you can't do it you're, you're never going to compete yeah. so but transferring that into asana obviously not not so effective really <laughs> Well, at the same time, though, I mean, there is a parallel to a certain extent that you know, if one stays within one's comfort zone, a lot of that you know, advanced contorting is going to stay off the menu. There has to be a stepping beyond the comfort zone to to get there. So the more kind of fixated one is on form uh, rather than function, then the, the likelier that is to come about. And I, I think you made another very good point in the article when you um, when you start to break down the multiple ways in which you were working with yoga, coming up with a sort of framework for what why practice is taking place in the, in the first place but you identified this sort of uh conflation kind of uh coming together of your pursuit of you know exercise really through asana and the identity you were developing through yoga um and the association of you know advanced practice with <laughs> advanced contortions obviously therefore compounds that process yeah absolutely and that nicely brings us back to the original question really is you know where did that article come from which is yeah i mean the culmination for me was recognizing i think with the it, with the hip issue that something wasn't quite right and, mm. and actually it's probably also worth highlighting i forget because it was you know i, I was there <laughs> <laughs> but it wasn't it wasn't yoga that produced the the symptoms that you know that brought it to my attention that there were difficulties i was yeah, I was. I turned fifty. I went to do some adventures. Adventures that I'd been. Some of them I'd been thinking about doing for a while. Some I hadn't. I was kind of returning to things I hadn't done for a long time, and um, they were great. It was fabulous. And the you know the the positive side of Asana is that I, at fifty I was physically very able to do things that I'd been doing at twenty. So when you um, say adventures, you mean mountaineering? Or? mountaineering i did a big solo kayak trip sea kayak trip um yeah, yeah there was uh, there was some climbing involved as well and quite a bit of mountaineering um yeah and you know in some respects i think again this is important to highlight to get a, a real sense of balance in how it sounds if somebody's hearing this for the first time what yoga practice i think developed in me was a a flexibility and a an overall sense of balanced strength hmm. that made me really quite well equipped to do things that I wasn't familiar with you know I had been familiar with them years earlier but I wasn't you know I wasn't doing any regular mountaineering at all I was walking the dog that'll be about it you know it was it was nothing more than that but I you know I could go to the Pyrenees to the to the Alps, to the northern Caribbean, uh, northern Caribbean, the Cantabrian mountains in northern Spain, and I could do these routes that, yeah, were routes that I'd been thinking about since I was twenty. Uh, however, and and actually to add to that, I was probably in a better mental state, able to deal with fear, doing these things on my own, so being in quite remote places without support you know, having to deal with that on my own. Yoga had taught me techniques that I used to cope with those difficulties. Now, I vividly remember on the on the kayak trip, sitting in really quite uncomfortable sea conditions and yeah, using breath control to mm -hmm. stabilize my emotional state to enable me to make the correct decision and take the next step. Um, could I have done that if I'd just done yeah, sea kayaking for the 30 years in between? Probably, actually, because I'd have done so much sea kayaking. But I hadn't done very much sea kayaking. So it was the yoga probably that contributed the techniques to help that process. So some real positives. But the flip side was what I had to recognize was that by the end of the big mountain trip to the Pyrenees I, I was injured my hip was really sore and stayed sore for well pretty much in, until the surgery at that point it never really got better and what looking back I can recognize is that although physically I was in good shape 
I wasn't in any way prepared for the particulars of the demands of mountaineering, mm. carrying weight, walking for long periods over really difficult ground. Um, yeah, I was I was perfectly trained to do ninety minutes of sweaty activity and then to have a little lie down. That's what <laughs> I'm perfectly trained for. <laughs> um, yeah, so the consequence was I got prolonged fatigue which put more uh, impact into the joints which showed up really the damage to the right hip joint that subsequently led to the hip replacement and aggravated the knee so at that point when I was 50 doing these trips it became clear that the the practice that I'd been doing which I guess I rather naively, even at that point, believed had a physical benefit that was pretty obvious. We didn't need to make much of an inquiry on that. Um, had its limits, had its um, consequences within that positive of the general health and fitness that it delivered. Um, and at that point, having recognized that in the context of the physical body, I began to ask questions about the, the other consequences and looking at, you know, things that had happened through life was beginning to say, well, okay, is this skillful? Is this enlightenment? Is this even anywhere close? This doesn't look very enlightened to me. That started to... step one. Is this non-harming? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, to me and to others. I mean, this was a period of, of life that was, you know, there was a lot of turmoil involved. So, yeah, again, in retrospect, what seemed to be happening was a, rather like the physical practice, there was a process of unraveling or letting go of old patterns unconsciously alongside some contraction or exaggeration of old patterns at the same time i'm not sure i'm being very clear there just if we think no i mean i i hear what you're saying but let's let's think actually in terms of your body obviously it's very specific to you but uh, was there something particular in what you were doing on a repetitive basis that was compounding almost the literal grinding of your <laughs> let's say thigh bone into your hip socket um that that, that just wore everything down or or is it not possible to look at it in, in terms of you know, asana activity in that way? Well, I, I, you know, I've done quite a bit of that reflection over the last few years, and I've, I've, I've come and gone with it, to be honest. Um, there are obvious things that aggravate mm -hmm. the hip and the knee. I don't do lotus at all anymore. Mm -hmm. For example, I don't even do half lotus anymore because the left knee just doesn't appreciate it. Mm -hmm. um, and even though I've changed the hip mobility and the approach to hip openers, it's still that the, the knee is so, there's no cartilage left on the medial meniscus anymore. So any play that comes into that joint is, is going to cause pain and aggravation to the, the, the bony plates. So it, it seems sensible to just drop that movement as something that is, not beneficial to me and in fact is negative it causes aggravation um but other aspects of practice are much more generic so the okay one territory that is relevant to um, ashtanga practitioners for example is the, the the focus on banda we talked about this briefly last time didn't we? Mm. But, um so much of the time in um practice we were encouraged and in fact it was very easy to see results associated with engagement of Mula Nudi and Abanda, particularly in the transitions particularly in the lift postures that, that are a little bit later on in the series uh, suck it all in and up suck it in and up yep um and what a yeah, again the hip forced this kind of re-inquiry with that process because what I began to realize was that um I was I'd misinterpreted that completely. And the the suck it in and up was happening, 
but it was happening along with all of the external muscles drawing in and up at the same time. So in terms of hip opening, you know, one of the things I began to explore with myself and then with with students who was who mm-hmm. sit in butterfly pose or padakonasana. Um, and again, we mentioned this before, so sorry to repeat, but if you if you draw in um banda in that posture um and then release banda in that posture for most of us there was a slight leg drop not a lot but enough to recognize that there was outer muscular engagement going on with the banda connection now that made me start start to ask some questions because how much am i doing of this and how much of an impact does that have on not the internal energetics, which is kind of what we were being pointed to in the language of Banda, but in terms of the physical structures of muscles and joints. In my case, the hip joint and the pulling of the hip joint into the socket uh, because of the contraction in and up. Um, and I, you know, I found a lot of it in my practice as I was going back to practice after uh, the the hip operation. And in fact before the hip operation i was already exploring as you might imagine i was already trying to find ways the restriction yeah because of the restriction and so i was finding a lot of these things um as i went so you know in some respects i wouldn't wish the hip thing on anybody but um in some respects it was the best teacher i had for a long time in the sense that it really focused attention on some key patterns that were playing out through my body Mm. um and of course i say through my body but some of those patterns that that try harder were psycho-emotional patterns they were more than psycho-emotional patterns they were narratives they were stories and this is a phrase i don't think i used in the article but is a phrase that's become really central to me in terms of my yoga practice now that we have you know I'm, i'm always a bit cautious about saying we as humans but i I as this human (laughs) have a tendency and i think it's a universal i think it is one of those things that we can see everywhere have a tendency to make sense of the world through trial and error in a way some of it's taught in which case i don't have to make the trial and error myself i just take what's given potentially talks about this actually but in much more concise terms that are much more difficult to recognize but in my view (laughs) we get given this information or we find this information we say okay a equals b um engage in and up and i can suddenly do jump throughs and we equate that with a result and we make a story out of it mm-hmm. in and up creates lightness and buoyancy and beautiful work and i live by that story once the story is kind of adopted and set it becomes a story that i make my own and what i see in myself is that you know i the i that i am that i think of myself as is just a tapestry of those stories yeah everywhere i look there is a story of some sort that i've either made up myself or i was given by my parents or I've developed in uh, cooperation with a partner or yeah culturally is is there in the background without me ever even knowing it but the web and weave of those stories is what yeah what makes me me and, and what did the, what did that inner storyteller think that yoga was doing for you in the years before you started to question what was actually happening yeah, that's that's a. I think that's a that's a very good question, but it's a difficult question to answer because I think it changed so much. Mm. You know, on some days I think it was the was the sense of achievement that came out of being able to do X. Um, in some days, it was the sense of purpose that came out of trying to do X. Um, there was also, and this I suppose brings us back to that article but there was also a sense of community and belonging that was very much yeah I mean I was blown away from the first big group led mm-hmm. practice I did where all those mirror neurons are going ballistic and you suddenly feel like you're an integrated part of this 
group of people you've never met before. Yeah. Wonderful feeling the first time it happened. And, you know, never, never really lost that sense of thrill of being part of that. Um, but then on a very personal basis, you know, made some great friends. And so it was all of, it was a lot of different things. And that's why I think it was, it is difficult now to say what was the, what was it what I was after? Because I think actually very quickly, there were multiple things that became rewarding. Yeah. So provisionally, you've come up with this sort of template that you were using in the article to, to you know, retrospectively explain things. And yoga as exercise was clearly a big part of it. Um, yoga as a uh, you know, way of developing identity was also a big part of it. You've just mentioned their community. There were a couple of other dimensions, though, as well, in relation to, I think, was it wellness and uh, transformation? Um, both of those sound a little bit more aligned with you know what we might think of as the traditional goals of yoga because you don't find too many yoga texts talking about yoga as exercise <laughs> although there are hints of it somewhere uh, yeah. but uh, you know it's much more about freedom from suffering so transforming one's experience of being you know in this mind and body and also removing some of the ailments that make it painful so um, and I think yeah just so they were both in the in the mix early on too although one was perhaps there as a kind of yeah pseudo form so let's deal with that second but the, the first one the wellness one was actually there all along um ironically given what we've just been talking about in terms of the the oomph factor that was you know playing a big part in my approach to practice um the thing that actually got me interested in yoga initially wasn't oomph at all. It was, mm. I went to a yoga class with my now ex-wife, um, a local yoga class in Abergavenny at the time. Mm. And I was working in a quite full on job at the time. And I just let go. I just stopped. It, you know, the class was a really gentle, restorative yoga, I would now call it probably, hmm. class um, that left me feeling fabulous, just nurtured, relaxed in a way that I hadn't felt for, well, if ever, I couldn't remember feeling like that. Hmm. So that was the hook, not the exercise. But what the Ashtanga form, I think, did was it got me in multiple ways mm. that enabled me then to kind of commit to doing it as a you know quite a big part of my life for all of these years um because it also kind of tapped on the door that i was familiar with and that i knew you know gave me a lot of joy and challenge and it just it, it was my home the effortful aspects to have that and then towards the middle of practice find a sense of settling and peace and just the, the gradual letting go of at least the psycho-emotional effort the overdoing mm. um into a zone of still doing a lot of doing but with a greater sense of peace and um yeah ease and then I was always, I do it slightly differently now, and still am, always a huge fan of Yoga Nidra. And even if it's just those five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, whatever you can manage at the end of the practice, where you just lie down. <laughs> so ironically, for me, both the effort and the, um, the off, the on and the off, were really important right from the start. Mm -hmm. Um yeah and the so the, the wellness aspect i suppose had its roots there in the recognition that there was something other than effort that was useful mm -hmm. um, and had an impact in terms of yeah the way i felt slept better um, and then as time went on the, the pranayama practices and the meditation practices really kind of consolidated some of that stuff into a really yeah i an ability to be more conscious of when the system was going a little bit out of whack 
a very recent example, you know, I came in in a bit of a rush, having finished a job late because of interruptions. Um, a lot of the, the adrenal response to that sense of rush was very notable to me as I came in to get ready to do this. So I just as I was washing all the sweat and muck off my face so I could sit in front of the camera, um, I, I did some basic breath awareness. Mm -hmm. And of course, it brings the whole system down to a point where you can engage in a different way. And um, yeah, I think it's easy to underestimate the importance of those very simple skills that are learned almost by default through even the simplest asset class, really. Well, that's the most interesting thing for me, I think, looking at the question of, you know, what's functionally beneficial in, in physical yoga practice. If we look historically, um, yeah, for most of the history of yoga, the only thing that people were doing with their bodies other than, you know, beating them up through austerities was sitting still or working with the breath. And, um, you know, I wonder how it might have been had you, you know, kept the, the wonderful uh, benefits of, of just letting go and relaxing, combine that with learning some breathing techniques, um, become a, a meditator as, as, as you've explored in other contexts as well, and just left the exercise for running, hiking, <laughs> kayaking, whatever it might be. Is it a problem perhaps that so much gets invested in this word asana and that yoga has now become synonymous with asana when actually it really needs to be separated from that asana can be a tool that can help with a yoga practice but the idea that it is yoga is the problem i i completely agree with that and i think that the yeah the idea that you know when we the, the, the words are used synonymously that you know we mm. use the word yoga to describe asana so often mm. even even those of us for whom yoga has become so much more than us that we'll still use the term interchangeably and it's yeah i think we're, we're getting confused we really are getting confused because the i mean the one thing that possibly is true is that for many modern practitioners western modern practitioners not even western modern people who are working in uh, an office style factory style environment where there isn't a lot of physical activity in their day-to-day -day life maybe there's a greater benefit to um, that kind of person to doing more asana than perhaps would have been the case if you were chopping your own wood walking long yeah. distances you know doing you know doing the things that those ancient yogis might have been doing um because you you know you didn't need the exercise in the same way that some of our sedentary um world has created the need for movement mm. um, so maybe asana should have a, a bigger place in the modern world than it had in the older world but i think you're right the d did it need to be there in terms of uh replacing swimming running i think in one respect i'd, I'd my suspicion is probably not but there is a territory and i think this is one I do hang on to. There is a territory where I think, Ashtanga, uh, not Ashtanga, where Asana offers something that isn't necessarily there in a lot of other physical activities. There are mm. places, other physical activities, where it is there. But I think the thing that Asana offers is a sense of exploration of unfamiliar mm. patterns. And I, I think that's, that has huge potential. Um, as a way of looking into the fifth element that we've just referred to, which is yoga for transformation. Because the one thing that um, asana offers as a, a laboratory, if you like, for exploring the way that we approach the world is by giving us unfamiliar things to do or things that trigger us in some way for mm -hmm. historical reasons. Backbends is kind of a classic one for a lot of people um you know, there's a huge fear response that comes up in a deep back bend for not everybody but a lot of people what are we exploring when we do back bends is it the physical movement the shape of the spine or is it the fear reaction that's associated with the shape of the spine 
you know, in the one context, you're really just worried about getting more mobility, more range of movement in terms of the physical body. But in the other context, what you, you might be able to explore is the is the fear trigger and the way you react to that fear. And of course, that's the territory that's really interesting in terms of transformation, because that territory is transferable directly to a lot of different aspects of life, whereas the back bending may not be. No, so, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So then there's really about how one is engaging with this you know, embodied technique that is known as asana, rather than the actual sort of idea that somehow the, the shapes have some magical property that if we just approximate those forms, something is going to flow automatically into us. Uh, it's, it's about how we're engaging with what we're doing and our inner experience of it and all, you know, all the relationships, as you just described, between that and the ways in which we are in all the other contexts of being alive and uh i wonder therefore whether you know, one of the advantages of asana is it's it's a you said it was a, a good way of training those those capacities but it's also a bit more accessible because it's quite hard to observe one's own patterns and start to see how to deal with them one can do that sat on the meditation cushion but that takes a little bit more discipline perhaps than showing up for a 90 minute yoga class or asana class there you go i've, I've fallen into the very trap i identified um so I wonder if that's another benefit, perhaps. I think you're right. And I think it's also, I mean, I've come across this over the last few years with people that, um, and many of them actually don't like the badges at all, but they're often referred to as the Scaravelli-inspired teacher mm. um, who focus very much on sensation and the, you know, the minutiae of um, sensory awareness, which is, which is fabulous, actually. It's a really brilliant, you know, exploration of sensation and therefore deep awareness of what's going on in the body at a particular moment in a particular position, often mm. quite a, a basic, non-dramatic position, a comfortable position, if you if you can start that way. But the problem that I've experienced personally, and certainly I've seen in others, is that for most of us, that just is it's like it's like having it's like giving me Shakespeare when I can't when I don't know the alphabet. I can't relate to it in any way. I can't make sense of what I'm being asked to to do because I can't feel any of it. Whereas you're right, throwing a shape, a pretty basic shape initially, is something everybody can have a go at. And in that having a go, especially if they're being guided skillfully there's a possibility that they can become a little more aware of the what's going on because of the novelty of it so it's it's not a complicated process it's just give them something unfamiliar give us something unfamiliar and see what we can do with it can we become aware of what's actually happening what's what we're doing in response to the challenge we've been given and so, how yeah. would one how would one approach teaching that skillfully uh, to use the language you just just shared? Um, you've shared also with me some other writing, which was I think titled "In Search of Embodiment," and you talked about embodiment really in those terms the you know, the, the ability to be sensorily aware of you know, what's actually happening inside us. And uh, I wonder, is it just a question of drawing people's attention to how they're feeling, or is there something else that can assist with communicating? what it is one is trying to do i suspect there is as many ways as there are people but mm. the um you know i over the years of both practicing and teaching because some a lot of the, the the models or the the pointers i use in teaching come out of my own practice but the the sorts of things that often help is to isolate sensory territories for people so yeah. as a teacher you can often see well they can either be locked down spots or, or locked open spots but they, they they're somewhere where you have a gap in the shape that's being made by somebody and that's not really looking at a forward bend as in you know referencing mr yenger in life on yoga that's just looking at this individual in whatever version of the forward bend they're making it doesn't really matter all you're looking at is the 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 sense of 
let's stick with one, the sense of compression that exists in their upper back, for mm -hmm. example, um, and bringing their attention either with a, a hand, which gives them a, a sensory contact, which often is all that's required to actually get people to feel into a territory that they are completely unfamiliar with, um, or through uh, a sense of connection. So some, you know, again, one of the most common ones is to try and get people to join up their awareness of the territory that they're focused on, their hands maybe, um, and the territories that those link to in terms of the whole back line in a seated forward bend, for example, everything from your, well, from your heels right through to your hands, but you know, mostly from your hips to your hands. So it can be done verbally, it can be done physically, and it can be done with lots of kind of analogies. The, the wetsuit analogy is the one I, I use quite a lot. So you, know, you imagine your whole system is a, is a wetsuit. Where is the wetsuit held tight? Have you, is somebody holding the wetsuit so it's not stretching as you stretch or as you wish to stretch? There's something that's holding that wetsuit in place. Um, yeah, so I mean, again, yeah, there's just a couple of ideas, but I think there are many ways which, and sometimes with, with students, you, I found you have to try multiple ways until something clicks, something falls right, whether it's repetition of something that they heard before or whether it's, because that certainly happened to me many, many, many times. Well, I said that to you four years ago, eh? for God's sake. But sometimes it's a, just a different way of saying the same thing that, for some reason, yeah, catches catches something that gets home and creates an awareness of, of what's actually going on. And that's often the first question is what's happening here? Hmm. So, yeah, I think asana provides that possibility. It is interesting because when I, after the hip replacement, um, I was... I was in a situation where I'd, I'd lost not just mobility, but a lot of strength through, um, well, both quadrants really, but but one was very unbalanced, which was the supporting leg, the other leg, if you like, and the the leg that was um, carrying the injury and then the surgery was really quite weak. So I, I was looking for something that was actually going to be quite focused in terms of strength building. And I ended up doing a whole series of different, um exercises some of which came out of you know the initial physio after the operation mm -hmm. some of which came from um weight training activities some of which came from and this was where it got interesting from some fitness training people that were focused not on achieving a particular outcome but were focused on creating new patterns within their clients bodies mm. so it, it, these people actually came from a completely different background but what they were doing with the challenges they were creating were was actually very similar in my mind to what i was being asked to do with asana it just so happened that some of the ones that they were inviting us to do or were inviting you know their clients to do were um particularly suited to the the weakness that i had developed in the in the injured limb if you like so they worked really well to go through a process of figuring out how to do them and then developing strength mobility and variability uh, in other words using those movements creatively for new shapes um in a way that yeah, could have happened in Asana years years before, mm -hmm. so, but didn't. Well, I wonder again if you know it's to do with where the emphasis falls, and um, if if the emphasis is on form. However much people like to talk about subtle body, you know, awareness that is developed through the adoption of the form and the movement through the sequences. Um, if that was instead allied to the cultivation of awareness for a purpose, not just for you know the sake of feeling, but to turn that to some particular end, because surely if we're talking about patterns and changing them and the ultimate transformation that yoga has always historically been about, 
it's about seeing how we get in our own way, compound our own misery, um, and needlessly create more and more obstacles for ourselves. And so I wonder whether yeah, physical practice can be taught much more in a way that aligns to the idea of taking all of this understanding into in, into everyday life and using it as a way to cultivate awareness because uh, another thing you noted uh, i think in the other piece of writing you shared was that in the end <laughs> if we're going to deal with things like glaciers a sort of negative formulation of patterning that that, that, that is, is obstructing us or the cultivation of positive qualities that might have liberatory potential um, you don't need to do anything physical for that it's something you can do at any time of your day but obviously if you haven't got the ability to feel into things or to pay attention or to concentrate it's quite hard to do that so i wonder if the two can be brought together more effectively in your opinion i i, I do and the the piece that the piece that I can't answer is I don't know how you do it from day one in a yoga class. Mm. Um, I haven't got there, which is one of the reasons I don't teach weekly, you know, casual classes anymore. Same. Um, <laughs> I may come back to that, but at the moment yeah. I can't figure out a way of doing it with integrity, knowing what I think I know or being aware of some of the pitfalls that I've certainly become aware of over the last few years. But can I, can I practice like that from where I am today? I certainly hope so. I certainly try to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that, you know, introduces a, an interesting question about what becomes practice. And at some point, I think, you know, the idea of practice starts to dissolve a little bit because if your practice is only ever something you do on, you know, that little mat, colored mat in the corner, yeah. um, I can't help feeling we're missing a large chunk of the, the potential of yoga. And yeah. in fact, if that's the case, even pretending that all of the, the other stuff, you, you know, you refer to the, the glaciers and the, the opportunities for the Brahma Vihara and all the, you know, the, the big philosophical concepts that are incredibly useful, but aren't necessarily evident or focused upon during the asana practice on the colored mat and we also find plenty of examples of accomplished practitioners who you know behave not particularly pleasantly to one another yeah i yeah i i, I completely agree with that i tried to stop saying it but uh, yes i agree and but that also um that does point to a, a little bit of a an issue that is something that is quite forefront in my um, approach to the kind of workshops that I do teach now and certainly the writing that I'm doing at the moment which is that trying to find a way of presenting some of the the big ideas in yoga and by that I mean some of the ideas mm -hmm. that come out of things like Patanjali um, in a way that is not oblique or intangible or subject to something I think I was guilty of for at least the first decade of practice, which was something I've heard referred to now as spiritual bypassing, hmm. which is that you talk the talk. We're doing this because it's going to make us enlightened. We, you know, we are um, peaceful and harmonious and we're not, you know, there, there is a real divergence between the words that we speak the books that we read the quotes that we attach to and the reality of what's going on in again I, I shouldn't say that as a generality because I don't know what anybody else is thinking feeling or experiencing but for me I sense that disparity between the really honest internal view and what I might like to be the case as a result of being part of something that seemed to have its roots in this inevitable pathway to somewhere well if it's any consolation i mean i spend a lot of my time talking about the the lofty aspirations of uh, transformative philosophies and uh, i'm constantly disappointed by the recurring examples of my own inability to live up to said loftier aspirations for myself or although i'm getting better at paying attention to that and making more progress with uh, letting go of some of my tendencies sometimes um, 
but you know the reality is I'm somebody else is stumbling along which also can make it difficult sometimes to feel you know I should stand up and talk about this stuff because the honest thing to do might be to you know, go and sit down quietly and try and make some progress with eradicating it all before talking to anybody else but I think there's some wow. there's some benefit to saying you know I, I, I'm another person who's trying my trying my best with you know uh, the hand I've been dealt um to not not fuck up so much pardon yeah. the phrase I, and we yeah again we we talked about this a little bit the other day but the in terms of something like the Clacius, for example, I, for me, it's been really useful to kind of reframe the Clacius, not as obstacles, but as tendencies. Mm. And it sounds like you know, pedantry, really. But for me, what I see in the Clacius is that's being human. Yes. But if you If you look at almost any attribute of human behavior, it's and Patanjali says this, but he says it in a way as if it's something to be dismissed or overcome. And I'm not sure that's useful. It's useful only in the sense that it highlights the tendencies through which we experience the world, which is our tendencies as human beings. And then the idea of not having the glaciers seems a bit farcical because the only way that can happen is to stop being human. Which, of course, is I know one, where Patanjali is off to. <laughs> well, it's certainly one interpretation of where Patanjali is off to, isn't it? That yeah, he, the only way to accomplish the ultimate samadhi is to cease being of this world, really. <laughs> um, and you know, again, I, I've I've kind of been in a circle with that one too. In that, I I don't know where that comes from. I have no idea in terms of a a principle whether it's somebody's experience that um, allowed them to point that whether it was a group of people deciding this was a great way to generate a uh, a disciplined following in the way that dare i say it, other religions have used mm -hmm. the afterlife as a, a you know a promise to be fulfilled if you behave yourself in this life um or whether it's it's just misinterpretation down the centuries by people that are kind of doing what we do with Ashtanga, which is we just repeat the dogma without really looking at the implications. And yeah, I, I think we can be really honest about things like the glaciers in our very flawed humanity. Mm -hmm. Because if I recognize that constantly working with grasping and aversion is part of who i am i'm never going to get rid of it but i might become more skillful in terms of the way that i use those human tendencies um that can lead to well again there's all sorts of phrases for it that the upaya the skill, skillful means approach mm. the idea that we can be um optimized in terms of our reactions um it is something that's possible but only in the moment so in the next moment i reach for the extra donut you know it's <laughs> kind of yeah it, i mean the, the phrase that i've used a lot in the in the writings is enlightened action rather than enlightened being so that you know yeah. that, the idea that we've got this goal of reaching a destination you know labeled enlightenment is for me, it doesn't feel very useful. I don't know whether it's no. true or not, but it just doesn't feel very useful. I uh, wholeheartedly really agree. Important. And I think in the end, you know, that's what we have to acknowledge with potentially. It just sort of stops and doesn't really say what you do after that. So it's, it's really yeah. open to question. But uh, in any case, the the idea of the you know, the highest samadhi to which he's pointing is so far removed from where most people are spending most of their time anyway that it's, it's entirely academic. A friend has a very nice metaphor that I relentlessly borrow um, that uh, he's talking about life as a butterfly ultimately which is something that we caterpillars are not familiar with at the moment so far better to think about you know how to be less you know conditioned and uh yeah, unhelpfully oriented in, in what we're doing right here right now crawling around on our leaves than to start worrying about what happens when we've turned into something else and i, I think the other thing that's 
that's worth acknowledging in in referencing back to some of those kind of statements that come out of historical texts is that the world is so different. Exactly. You know, it's so different today than what it was then. And our awareness of, you know, collectively quite what an impact we're having as the the glacier machines, the 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 people that we are. The institutionalized greed, fear, and ignorance of the world. <laughs> well, it does raise the question. This is, you know, this is something that again I started looking at a number of years ago with with Nancy and then later with um the Upaya Zen Center in New Mexico. And you know, they've mm-hmm. got a wonderful phrase that they call their approach engaged Buddhism. And that's part of a you know a rolling movement now in in the states which is yeah it's got its faults the same as any other movement but the the idea that it's kind of irresponsible to even consider the idea of just withdrawing from this samsaric muddle given the perspectives that you might be able to achieve or get glimpses of through some of these practices it's um yeah, I mean, there there are ethical priorities that are kind of built into that. And obviously there's perspectives, well, we're all going to go bang in the end anyway because the sun will explode. Does it really matter whether we go extinct in the next 300 years? <laughs> and there's all of those sort of metaphysical, philosophical things. But, you know, here in my body right now, does it feel right to behave in a way that allows all that stuff to go on? Mm. The injustices, the ecological disasters that, no, it just doesn't. It doesn't feel right, especially when you're talking about, you know, compassion and kindness and equanimity in so many other contexts in the in the philosophy um, bag. It doesn't make sense to separate from all of that beyond beyond the useful process that separation does allow, which is, you know, for most of us, there is a lot of benefit in actually stepping out, stepping out river for a while but mostly to actually see what the river is doing as it flows by Um, and I guess you know that's something that when potentially was when the original text if we can ever say that when the the, those stories were written that wasn't something that was present certainly not on the scale that we now are aware of you know I guess it had its micro scales Hmm. even then but but yeah what we're seeing now is a completely different manifestation of that and it's recent you know it's the last 250 years all of this acceleration the yeah we'll we'll have fun call it the great acceleration that that's when all of the incredibly intense period of change in human history and global history is taking place the fourth mass extinction event taking place within know what's essentially not even a heartbeat it's a nanosecond of existence and in this in relation to the history of the earth but it's all happening in this very narrow window of human history so yeah do we want to disappear in a puff of butterfly smoke well you better make sure there's this butterfly still available to disappear into because well that's a good point isn't it yeah yeah you're saving up for your chrysalis and it's all too late Which, I guess, brings me back to the one last thing I'd like to raise. Um, You mentioned this phrase, spiritual bypassing, and without getting sort of tangled up in in, in the deeper meanings of it, basically, you know, hanging out in my bliss bubble and ignoring the reality of being a complicated mess of a person is sometimes, you know, the the original source of that from from John Wellwood's uh, formulation, although it now sort of means anyway, basically sticking your head in the sand and using love and light language to pretend it's all very noble. you mentioned in your article the resistance that you got from some people when you actually turned the question, why practice yoga, over to them. And I, I wonder why you think they were so resistant. Did did you get the impression they felt that you were trying to sort of pull the pleasure away from underneath them that they thought they were deriving from this practice just purely because you didn't quite feel so, you know, uncomplicatedly in love with it anymore or was it something else is there some subtler shadow reason for that resistance 
again, I think there's probably quite a number of different stories at play. Mm -hmm. For some people, it's possibly that they felt challenged and therefore became defensive. So there's a sense, even though you know, it may not have been there at all, there was no sense of criticism, but asking the question for some people is received as a critical inquiry, having to make some sort of coherent answer. So there was possibly that story running for some people. I think for for others, there was a, there's a generic resistance to the kind of the analytical language that is implied in the idea of a goal and a destination um, and a method for getting somewhere. Um, and there's a narrative that certainly I've experienced in a number of different people in a number of different contexts, but it's quite prevalent in some parts of the yoga world where mm. we don't like that approach. That's a, that's a negative approach. That's the mainstream. That's how everything yeah. works. What we want is something different to that. And nothing to do, nowhere to go, just flow along the yoga river. Yeah. But of course, what strikes me in that is okay, that's a goal. Yeah. Yeah. That's what you want. And um, involves doing the same practice every day as well, <laughs> which is fine as long as, you know, you kind of are you getting what you want? Is, mm. is it working for you? Is it is it doing what? So it's still there. And there's still, to my mind, some benefit in engaging even very gently with the question about what am I doing? Why am I doing it? What's it giving? What's it achieving? Even if the achievement is a stepping out of achievement for a while, that's a result. And it, it's a perfectly valid result in my opinion, but it's, it's nonetheless a result. So yeah, I mean, yeah. I can't speak for other people's stories, but no, those, those I just wonder what's yeah. what, what what sort of sense you'd got when people were kind of oh, steady on, um, because it it does sort of uh, occur to me that in light of what we've just been discussing and really sort of the underlying theme of of, of a lot of the conversation, really the, the implication that there's more to yoga than asana um, suggests that some people are yeah you know, very much aware of that and at the same time unsure how to engage with it and and don't really know what to do with that question other than to hope that somehow everything their teachers have told them is is magically happening and uh because it's quite hard to find something to hold on to in the, these these bigger questions without going a bit further with the inquiry and realizing that it's actually up to us to orient ourselves and take responsibility for paying attention to whether or not we are aligned with the intentions that we have set out for ourselves then it's okay. Yeah, you know, we can have whatever intention we like, and we can you know, see whether or not we're fulfilling it. There's, there's no requirement to sign up for the particular list of you know unicorn growth <laughs> yoga strategies. Um, it it could be just as simple as you say, as you know, getting some relaxation and rest. But if you discover that actually you're depleting your resources, then maybe you're not getting what you were thinking you were getting. So it's it's just about that, isn't it? It's about paying attention, and that's really at its heart what yoga's always been about. I mean turns to different ends in different ways over the centuries but paying attention is is really the sort of where the rubber hits the road yeah in terms of the central tool the common unifying approach if you like i think i think that's absolutely right um and what's of course what's interesting in that is that the same form of paying attention can be applied outside yoga mm. so you know i'm a keep a lot of bees well bees are possibly the most effective way of drawing your attention to one point in focus it's just yeah. an extraordinary captivation of what's going on particularly if things are getting a bit excitable um so there are many ways to actually pay attention in a really one-pointed way but the reason i think we we shouldn't discard the texts is that there are so many questions raised in in the connection of our in the connection to our current range of stories mm -hmm. that i think the texts provide a really use whether we receive them through you know a teacher's interpretation in language that is much more accessible or whether we have to go and struggle with the original often very inaccessible languaging um either way 
that pointing to something different rather than simply the the goals that might be easily visible to us i think is where um the tradition of yoga i I i'm very wary of that term especially talking to you but the, the the tradition of yoga comes into its own and why you know i would be really reluctant to ever pretend to be doing or offering something that was wholly of my making it's Mm. been so colored by those teachings and all of the errors and successes that i've encountered through the little journey i've made um and i don't just mean personally but through some of the through some of the readings mostly my input is i'm not great um computer bod so I, and certainly the social media thing have got nothing to do with it but the the books that have been written that describe the contexts of travel i mean, i really love jack cornfield's story-based mm-hmm. teachings because they're so grounded in um in everyday life but they bridge the gap towards some of the deepest buddhist teachings well, and, indeed. I mean, they come from studying with, you know, a master teacher in Thailand. So he's he's got the foundation. But he's also really taken it into the everyday life of the people he you know he's worked with in the states or his hmm. working life. And the same goes, you know, the, um, Stephen Cope wrote a book called The Wisdom of Yoga, which I'm I'm sure you're familiar with. But that's the book that I often recommend to people who are beginning to get interested in yoga and the reason i recommend it is that it's again it's based in people's lives so it's it gives somewhere to start in terms of trans Mm. translating what is you know often quite esoteric or distant um into something that is very much more meaningful in your own life and i think that's where it becomes a very personal journey and one that you know that step is so so important for the yoga transformation if there is no you know direct springboard from being able to quote sections of the sutras into having examples in your own life where you encountered a version didn't see it for a long time then began to see it then began to work with it and changed your relationship to that particular context of a version you know, that's where transformation takes place. That's it. It's not in mm. being able to quote the sutra. It's in the transposition into personal experience. And that's obvious to say, but it's, yeah, it's not necessarily obvious to do. And that was my experience here for a long time. I could, I could talk the talk. Um, but I, I think genuinely, I didn't really know how to begin to walk the walk. And certainly, you know, I'm not for a second pretending that's how I walk every pace of every day. In fact, most of the time is spent crawling along the ground. But occasionally you manage to take a step that fits that profile. Mm-hmm. And that's a learning opportunity. What did I do then? How did that pause happen that allowed a different reaction to something that I previously would normally react in this way to? No, thank you for sharing that. I- I wholeheartedly agree. And I think you know, the challenge is that there aren't many people who who are teaching that. Um, and it's 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 hard to think of examples from my own experience with you know, many accomplished and, and uh, you know, insightful yoga teachers who've really had a, a knack for that in the same way that they have for <laughs> You know, explaining practices or, or speaking about you know their own experiences you know one or two I, I've, I've had the good fortune to meet a couple of people who were you know really have been the wellspring of inspiration for me doing what i do but um i do feel i'm you know, <laughs> flying alone sometimes in my attempt to make sense of things and and i agree you know, even more with what you said about tradition um there may be no one single tradition. In fact, there's endless different ways in which all the traditions contradict each other. Um, but if we don't have some connection to some dimension of, of the bigger picture questions being raised in the history of yoga, then it's questionable why we should call any of this yoga, never mind asana, um, because we're just 
doing what we want and giving it that title because it sells. And so there is an orientation that's sort of coming out of, of yoga traditions, which is helpful. And to try and find even just one thing to engage with you know, on whatever level is the way to make progress with that. And often when I'm presenting these ideas in a yoga teacher training context, it, it's it's that that I leave as a sort of final message in a way. Is this, uh, If you can find something from all of these texts that we've looked at that speaks to you now that you you know how to develop your you know, relationship with in such a way that you can perhaps even talk to other people about it just one thing then that's 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 enough that's something to work with and then after a while maybe something else comes along um and you know, that's that's something to to get us started but uh it's it's not organized in the same way as the postural sequences and you can show up to a room with lots of other people doing it the same the same way so it's it's harder it's a challenge um but I wanted to ask you just finally before before we wind up um in your writing you know obviously you in some ways are engaged with that project you know you're talking about why you've been doing what you you're doing and also how that fits into this bigger picture of what what yoga is actually about and <laughs> for you at least um in a way that relates to where you are here and now I wonder if you could say a few words about your aspirations for that for that writing would you like that to turn into a book um do you have a sense of what it might say? Yeah, I've got a finished first draft. You know, oh, wow. Be, Congratulations. On the first draft. Well, thank you very much. Mm. It did take a lot getting there. But um, yeah, it came out of a... It came out of what you're referring to, really, which is that the idea of talking about yoga as this wider exploration that encompassed things like the goal of yoga for transformation was something that didn't appear to be in the language of most yoga that I was encountering mm -hmm. and yeah I even went through a phase where I wondered whether you know we need a new we need a new name here because yoga has been co-opted into you know a thing that is it's not without value, but it's no. so far away from, you know, the transformative aspects of yoga mm -hmm. that it's almost a different animal. Mm -hmm. Maybe we should call it something different. Maybe we should just call it Dharma instead. I mean, that takes it back into There's the realm where the Buddha's speaking. Yeah. Or whatever. But yeah, something that is... <clears throat> so anyway, the, the idea with the, um, with the book was to try and find a way of expressing not in an academic way, partly because I didn't feel able to do that. And having read, you know, books by, I haven't read your book, but I've ordered it. But oh, the, thank you. <laughs> you know, I've read a lot by people that are academics studying mm -hmm. yoga lineage and yoga philosophy, um, recognizing that that work had kind of already been done up to a point uh, where there was a lot of new emergent work coming out um, in terms of yoga history that was really interesting to me at, you know, in the 10, I suppose maybe 15 years ago now, but the, mm. that all fed into a, a desire to write a book that was much more about making sense of it from a, a 21st century middle-aged white man living in a very privileged place in my context. Mm. So yeah, it's only ever going to be uh, my context but the idea to try and take a broader picture and keep some of that very personal element was what I set out to do with the with the book the the, the difficulty that I'm facing at the moment I actually set it aside about 12 or even 18 months ago now I set it aside for a time to try a different completely different approach uh, which was I'm still working on a um, a fiction, completely fiction story, which nonetheless touches into quite a lot of the territories that are in the the non-fiction book, and that's that's another approach. I'm not sure that'll work either. But the the, the non-fiction version was about trying to find a way of incorporating the philosophy into the everyday, along mm. with you know that chapter that I sent you, which was much more about you know, how do we work with Asana in a in a way that is perhaps not the mainstream or the, the majority uh, 
the way the majority of people would encounter us and are taught, but in a way that might be more helpful in both achieving the physical ends of Patanjali's steady comfort, um, but also the the more immediate targets of or goals of some people that might be to do with um, wellness or exercise. But in both cases, there's an approach that is not simply turning up, throwing a few shapes, reading what's supposed to happen and hoping for the best. Mm -hmm. um, which again, I mean, it's again, it's interesting to hear you say you haven't encountered many teachers talking that way, but I wonder whether part of that reason, the reason for that is that there's, it's actually really challenging to talk about a personal reflection of something mm -hmm. that is a generic form that reaches back so far. It almost feels like you're step, stepping up and saying, this is how I understand. And this is right because it's, it's my viewpoint and finding a way to language that that isn't that because there's no kind of dogma or prescription in any of what I've written. It's just about, you know, a perspective that is, has some conclusions in it, but they're only ever working conclusions quite honestly, because the whole thing just keeps changing. Well, exactly. Uh, yeah. And I mean, yeah, I had the audacity to title my book, the truth of yoga. And the first thing it tries to say is that you know, I haven't got the whole truth as infinite truths and they all contradict each other and really all i'm trying to do is explain that to start with and then also the end of it is to come to the conclusion that unavoidably <laughs> we are going to be innovating and uh, we are going to be speaking about our perspective because that's what it means to be in a mind and a body uh, and to live now rather than pretend that we're sort of you know historically reenacting whatever it was two and a half thousand years ago uh this this requires us i think to to take ownership of that and and we can do that humbly in the way that you're you know, articulating it doesn't have to be standing up beating the chest saying i, you know, I have the one true yoga come follow me <laughs> it's, yeah. it's almost the antithesis of that it's removing the suggestion that's what we're doing it's like no this is this is how i see things uh, uh, in fact there's you know ashtanga teacher in london hamish hendry wrote a little pamphlet to, he put out in the pandemic if i remember rightly which is all quotes from the bhagavad gita he gets to the very end he says this is how i understand the bhagavad gita and when i saw that i was, I was actually really happy you <laughs> know didn't sort of say this is what the gita says and then come up with some you know kind of contortion of it into 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 what he wanted to say he just said this is how i interpret it and that's that's honest that's that's what we can do maybe it simulates something and it, i suppose th there is both uh, an incentive to do that in the sense that we you know we're every time i say this i think of monty python's life of brian but we, we're we really pushed to think of ourselves as unique individuals and mm -hmm. capable of anything that's part of our culture and therefore what i think is as valid as anybody else it's a it's a it's a strong push um but we're meeting in the yoga tradition whatever that means but we certainly i've seen it a lot where we come up against this thing where the only way i can deliver this is by reference to where it came from so my own nancy i will say it because i'm not because i'm saying it by inference so why not say it out front nancy is terrible at saying what she thinks she will say what she thinks she heard from Patabi Joyce mm -hmm. because the lineage is all important. And whether I haven't spent enough time in India to know whether this is the case, but I suspect that that's a very common principle within the, within the lineage structure that a lot of yoga has been passed down through, mm -hmm. that we, we try to prov provide our, our teaching in the context of what we were given mm -hmm. and i think that can be useful in that it takes some of the um the need to be completely my viewpoint novel mm -hmm. this is you know aids brand of understanding um it, it moderates that tendency but i think it also has a, as a, a negative side which is it 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 hides the deep personal insights which are perhaps the most important things that could be shared so the fear of doing that 
for fear of being, you know, putting yourself on a pedestal rather than passing on what you've been given. I think there's a real loss in that, that you, 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 you hide perhaps the most profound parts of your own experience of the teachings through yeah, referencing others, whether they're alive and connected to you or whether they're writers in the form of potentially or anybody else. And that, yeah, I think that's missing the point again. That's a form of spiritual bypassing to me these days. It's, you know, mm. it's a way of divorcing my experience from the textbook experience of what yoga should be. Um I think to answer your, your question about tradition in India, I mean, that seems to be the way in which one innovates in a traditional Indian context. That's probably why Krishnamacharya pretended that he got everything from long lost sources rather than admitting that he'd made things up as his own son Desikachar said that he did um, because he wanted to be, you know, a strict traditionalist. Uh, he just was creatively reinterpreting timeless principles rather than coming up with anything new. Um, but, you know, if we're living in a slightly different context i think it's almost you know, especially with concern about you know responsible engagement with different traditions it's almost you know incumbent on us to be honest about the fact that we're yeah developing things for ourselves by engaging with them and experiencing them and and therefore we you know, can only really speak from our perspective and if we're pretending that we're not <laughs> we're hiding that that's what we're actually doing exactly yeah yeah, yeah. Well, thank you, A. This has been really uh, rich conversation. Uh, we'd love to continue, but I think we should probably both uh, get on with something else for the rest of the day and uh, spare everybody's ears. But uh, perhaps we can reconvene at some point. And uh, I certainly hope to see this book of yours uh, out there in, in people's hands and uh, look forward to reading more of that. I need some help, Daniel, so I may well be in touch. It's uh... <laughs> well, that'd be, be a pleasure. Yeah. Thank you again. Thank you.